You gonna start with it? All right, Chris Peaks here, back here tonight with Bob Brooks for our second episode of our podcast about the Korean War, often called the Forgotten War. Uh, sorry, it's been so long since we've talked. Uh, just hadn't had had things come up, and uh, just hadn't been able to touch base with you. But tonight we're going to talk about Task Force Smith, which probably a lot of people never heard of. Uh, it'd be something very educational for me. Bob, how are you, man? I'm doing all right, sir. Any day above ground's a winner. You know how that goes. <laughs> yeah, I sure do. So um, tell us, uh, you know, t- tell me about Task Force Smith. Well, Task Force Smith was the, the first infantry units on the ground in Korea to prevent the uh, communist expansionism coming out of North Korea. Uh, it's basically the first major battle of the Civil War between uh, North Korea and South Korea. And uh, But we, we should back up a little bit and try to explain why this war even broke. The first thing to remember is that following World War II, there was no mention, like in 1949, there was no mention of the U.S. showing any support towards Korea other than a constabulary force. In other words, the U.S. was reluctant to give them tanks and uh, some of the heavier equipment that you would need to prevent somebody from invading you, right? Did the U.S. just not want to get involved in another war that soon? Well, that's that's part of the equation. I mean, uh, Truman understood that coming out of World War II, he would be best acknowledged as being the guy that ended the war. And he certainly didn't want to start World War III ah. with the Russian involvement of any sort of kind. And, uh, of course, he's up for re-election going into 1950, right? And so there's, there's some political motivations and there's some just logical motivations. And people give MacArthur, the, the guy they picked to run the UN forces, they give him a hard way to go. But the thing to remember is, at the time, the location, the events in hand, MacArthur would have been the best choice. You know, you got a guy sitting over here in Japan. Uh, he did what he did in Okinawa in World War II. And he just was the overall best choice at the time, considering the speed and the expediency and need of getting troops into Korea to help prevent the expansion. Okay? Now, on the opposing side for the North Koreans, Kim had been in talks with Mao Zedong and Stalin. Hang on just a second. Let me kill this. Him, who had done a lot of guerrilla warfare when the Japanese were in Korea, had gone to Russia, got uh, trained as a communist, and had talked to Stalin and Mao, and he wanted to unify the country after they made this 38th parallel cut. so Now, who did that? The United Nations made the, the 38th parallel cut? Uh, those allies versus Russians in the conversation. Uh, you know, Russia was trying to get, they were in a big land grab coming up. Mm-hmm. And the allies decided, well, 38th was just this random thought that somebody from the... Uh, administration thought would be a good idea and so was there an ongoing conflict between the communists and uh in the north and koreans in the south uh prior to this that led to that 38th no not prior to in world war ii uh the issue for both sides was to get the japanese out okay but when the russians came in to try to free up the uh north korean area they uh well, let's say they weren't the best of possible forces to do the job. Okay. Uh, there was no big push to unify the country, but the Russians, on the other hand, were not only trying to recover from the war, they were looking after, they were looking for tech. We take the B-29 super fortress in the case example. They had managed to get their hands on four of those because they didn't have a quad engine bomber with long distance range, right? So they couldn't deliver a big nuclear warhead all the way to the states as they had to. So instead of having their own uh, tech people put a bird together, they literally stole it from the B-29. There's a book on that called Hog Wild by Dwight Ryder. 
can read up on that. And it explains quite a bit about stuff going on in Korea prior to the war itself. Right? Uh, so anyway, long story short, Kim goes in, he talks to Mao, he talks to Stalin, he wants to unify the country. Meanwhile, South Korea, Sigmund Rhee, they want to unify the country, but the Allies didn't give them the materials to get the job done, right? So the perimeters were set along the 38th parallel. And Kim had gone in and he still continued some of that guerrilla warfare. There was a lot of fighting after World War II and the Japanese were removed. There was a lot of you know, little guerrilla work going across the 38th into South Korea, trying to get uh, you know communist expansionism on its way. It was a fledging, fledging issue at that point. But when Kim gets a hold of all these tanks and all this uh, Russian support, all this Chinese support, he's ready to make a break and come June 25th, 1950, he makes his move at 4 a.m. in the morning. The only thing there to stop him is constabulary force with no heavy artillery to get the job done, no tanks to stop these tanks from coming in. So Kim sends in about 33 tanks of the 105th uh, North Korean People's Army across the 38th parallel. Uh, they they capture Seoul almost immediately. And Truman, with the UN, decides, you know, we got to stop this. So they rush some forces together. And the first group they put together is the 21st Infantry under a guy named General Dean. And they had one artillery group, about 120 guys. The rest of them were infantry from the 21st. And they lined themselves up maybe about 20 miles south of Seoul, maybe five miles south of Suwon. Now, are these U.S. troops? Yes, U.S. For the 21st Infantry, 1st Battalion, 21st Infantry. Okay. They're completely undermanned. They have uh, antiquated material. I don't think they only had like maybe six high explosive uh, artillery shells. I mean, there's there's a lot of bad ammo going in. Uh, some of their guns were still in Cosmoline because they were just thrown together, right? And their job is to stop this onslaught. The 105th, 105th military of North Koreans with T-38 tanks from coming across. Good luck to that. The T-30, you said T-38? T-34, I'm sorry. Okay, okay. Thank you for correcting me. I appreciate that. Okay, I didn't know if they had, I, no, I didn't know if there had been a new tank that had come out since uh, since then. Oh, um, so. All this stuff starts running in my head. I get too much yeah. in and it all starts rubbing together, right? Right. So, Task Force Smith, they set up a uh, defensive line yeah. along the um, Osan Road. If I can get my range. Yeah, along Osan Road. There's there's some write-ups about the battle there. They find some high ground. It's about five miles south of Suwon. And the first eight tanks that come across, they start you know, peppering them with mortar and artillery, and it's just bouncing off these T-34s. It's not doing anything. Oh, the T-34s, was that had that much armor on it? Yeah, I mean, it was it's a, it was a sturdy tank for what it's worth. You can compliment the Russians for that. Uh, I mean, I've often heard that pound for pound in World War II, it was probably the best tank that came out. I mean, I've heard arguments both ways on it, but, I mean, obviously it was a sound tank for its time. Well, yeah, I would I would put it up against the uh, I would put it up against the Sherman, but at that point it depends on what cannon you're running. You know, okay. If the Sherman has the eighty eight, then yeah, we're good to go. If it has the seventy six, we're good to go. If it's pushing the, the seventy, I think it was the seventy five, uh, it didn't work so well, right? And uh, okay, the Russians, strangely enough, everybody wants to believe that these tanks coming across were all driven by North Korean. Uh, tankers, and that's not entirely true. Three of the tanks were taken out, and, and let me break this down how they came across. So the first eight tanks come across, and they can't stop. I mean, they literally just keep on the road and go straight on through. 
They knock one tank out, and basically because they busted up the treads on it, right? So the other tanks come on through, and you can see them past their ridge that they're covering further south of them as they go over this little road. The next thing that happens, there's 33 more to follow, right? And basically, right. same outcome. You know, they just blast right through. And uh, these four guys on the 21st are sitting up on these ridge lines and they're just getting hammered, you know. And about 40 minutes after that group goes through, there's eight more on the way. This time they're backed by infantry, okay, which kind of changes the rules a little bit. They get within a thousand yards, and Dean says, hit them with everything you got. The problem is, uh, you can see these tanks where they have uh, bazooka rounds. You know, they have the, the 2.56 bazooka pattern on them. And they, they know they're getting hit even with the mortars, but it's not penetrating. It's not doing any good. And a lot of that uh, stuff wouldn't even fire in the first place. This is like five, six, eight year old uh, shells that aren't exploding. They, they're not even coming out of the tubes. You know, it's just defective fire, right? They didn't have anything new. Everything they had was antiquated, I guess, for lack of a better word. I mean, it's been five years since if it was used in live action. And they didn't have time to test their, their mortars. They didn't have time to test their guns, you know, to, um, what do you call it, line up your guns, sequence them. I'm looking for a word here, and I can't find it. Anyway, they were probably as ill-prepared for what they had to face as you could possibly be. And it's important to remember the Korean War in and of itself is sometimes called a war on a budget. Truman didn't want another war. For them, for him, it was a police action. And he had to put something together that would hold him off and recapture up to the 38th parallel. That was always the goal. Let's get back to the 38th. You know, I wonder when the phrase you just used, police action, when that became part of our military doctrine. Because, you know, being in Afghanistan and when we had the war in Iraq, uh, you know, and then it goes into police action, we're, we're not trained to be police officers. Right. Um, you know, we're, we're trained to conduct military operations. So, you know, I, uh, I wonder when, when did we go from Winning wars to to conducting, you know, more police officers, police sections. What 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 changed that? Yeah, you have well, opinion on that? Limited war, limited war for what it's worth. In my opinion, in my opinion, starts in the Korean War. You know, it's, it was a war that had a certain amount of objectives, and it, it was never considered an all-out war like you saw in World War Two. You know, you saw German or Japanese in World War Two. It was all-out war. It wasn't. Uh, you know, hey, let's be nice about this. And we only have these small objectives. You know, the the whole point was to get both Germans and Japanese to surrender. All right, that wasn't the goal in Korea. The Korea, and from what I gathered, is hey, let's get them back to the thirty eighth, and uh, we'll start all over from there again. Truman didn't want a World War Three, and he knew they had Russian involvement. This brings up an interesting point: of the three tanks. In the first part of the 21st infantry fight, three tanks were taken down. And a small group of soldiers discovered that uh, there was still life in one of these tanks, right? They peppered a little bit. One soldier climbs out of the top of this thing. Turns out he's a Russian sergeant, and they, they took his applets off his shoulders, and they were going to turn it in to uh, headquarters, right? Because this tank was being driven by a Russian. Now, who else was in the tank with him? I do not know. But that story was recorded. Uh, the applets were never found. So I, I don't take that as rumor in my my reading. That's, that's not rumor. That's Russian involvement. And the, the Russians also, in the air uh, part of the war, were known to fly these North Korean MiGs that they'd given them and give the Russians a chance to bloody some of their pilots, right? The problem was is that if, if you do the reading, you'll discover that these Russians weren't very good at faking uh, the North Korean language. And you can tell in the earlier part of the war, 
that uh, with their MIGs, they were really, really good and better than they should have been if they were just North Korean pilots, fairly newly trained, if you understand what I'm following. Their, their tactics, yeah. were, the amount of amount of birds they shot down. I mean, their, their knockout rate was pretty high on the front end of that. And that started changing over time, right? But, uh, you know, the Korean War was unique in a lot of ways. It was the first time two jet uh, airplanes went against each other in war. It was the first time that helicopters were used as a uh, piece of military um, offense. So up to that, it was, it was not used. A lot of, a lot of them were used to, you know, that moves so mm-hmm. good, you know, for healthcare, bring, bring these injured guys back to the behind the lines or whatnot. But in Korea, they became a what? I lost your picture again somehow. Oh, sorry. I, I was doing something. Okay. Uh, down here. I, just, I just turned the camera off for, for a minute. You but, uh, uh, dogs get in the way, and I'm trying to <laughs> uh, push them out. I don't want them in the camera, so I was push, uh, getting them out of the room. All right. So General Dean is in charge of the 21st Infantry coming into Korea, right? Mm-hmm. And there's there's three major fights. Um, Cholon or Cholon, T-H-O-N-A-N, that's one of them. Uh, the Battle of Osan is the first one. That's the 21st Infantry issues. They bring in the uh, 34th Infantry. They bring in uh, the 1st Cavalry. So what's that fight like? How many people are involved? I mean, is it a... Um... It's small against big. It's it's okay. five six hundred guys, uh, five hundred and four, I think it is something like that, on the twenty first, going against about uh, three to six thousand. I mean, it, it was just crazy. It was, I mean, is it just like a slugfest? Uh, are these guys trying to hold the line? I mean, um... well, when the infantry comes out of uh, Suwon, it, it does become a slugfest, but. The 21st was so well routed because, you know, they still had all this tank support coming out of the North Koreans that the infantry just couldn't, they couldn't fight against it. They had nothing to stop them, right? They had limited ammo, and some of the ammo they had wasn't more than damn they have anyway. So, Did any of it break into hand-to-hand? Uh, I don't I don't know that it broke down to that. Uh, I know that there were some captures. And they were later said they were murdered about three months later. I know some of them went into POW camps. General Dean was one of them. That's the first time I can recall a general actually being captured and being a POW. He ends up getting the Medal of Honor after surviving the war. Uh, there's a few other 21st guys who are in that equation. But uh, they're backed up. As time goes on, you know, they're, they're a blocking force along with the 1st Cavalry, the 34th Infantry, the, the 19th Infantry gets involved, the 29th Infantry gets involved, and all of this is just to slow the progress of the North Koreans so that they can set up a perimeter. General Walker's 8th Army sets up a perimeter around Pusan as far north as Tagu, and it sweeps around westerly down the ocean again along the, the Kun River and the Noktong River. So these forces really, I wouldn't call it a suicide fight, but it wasn't much different. They're fighting the 4th and 6th North Korean divisions. So think of it that way. You have a division coming at you, right? And your first interlude with them, you got 500 guys, you know, 120 some other artillery guys, the rest of them are infantry, uh, 300 some other are listed, and you're fighting a division? I mean, that's 10,000 plus guys coming at you. How do you win that? Especially with faulty material. I don't, I don't think it gets any uglier than that. You know? Wow. If the technology was different, if it was like today, then you're okay. Then, now, you know, is this battle around a city or town? Was there any urban combat fighting going on? Uh, this is pretty much open field. You're south of okay. Suwon. It's an airport at Suwon. And George, just north of Suwon is Seoul, or to the north and east of Suwon is Seoul. Uh, if you can imagine, you're coming in from the west at Incheon, and you turn, you head south, and the first uh, major town would be Suwon. If you keep heading directly east, you're going to Seoul. 
Now they'd already captured Seoul. That, that took little, little, no time whatsoever. You know, Seoul so close to the 38th parallel, it's even ridiculous at this point. Uh, not where I would hold my capital if my uh, next door neighbor was my enemy. You know, kind of like Richmond in DC. Um, the well, this is well between your enemy's capital, you know, your border and capital. Uh, in the Civil War. Yeah, you would want your capital somewhere centralized. You know, you wouldn't want it as close to a, uh, you know, MLR, you know. That seems a little bit ridiculous. Now, at least in the, you know, in the Civil War, they moved you, tried to move it to Atlanta, right? In memory search? Uh, well, they it started off in Montgomery. Montgomery, and, Montgomery. Yeah, and then they moved it to Richmond, um, because Richmond was the biggest, wealthiest, um, most uh, cosmopolitan uh, city or state, city state in the South. Um, um, you know, it controlled 20, had 20% of the population, like 80% of the industry. Uh, there's so many reasons they moved it to Richmond, which, you know, making, like you said, it would make more sense keeping it in Montgomery um, uh, in a centralized location. Right. Sorry, I didn't mean to get off that subject there with you. You're fine. On June 25th, you have 10 divisions of North Koreans coming across that border. All across from east to west on the 38th parallel, 10 divisions. Right? That's a whole lot of firepower you got to deal with when all you can add to it. And, and that's the other thing. Half of the South Koreans uh, had the weekend off from that hit. They weren't even positioned. They had to be called up and called back to, you know, to get the fighting. So I wouldn't, don't think that the South Koreans were weak. Don't get that opinion of the situation. Some of these guys were basically becoming human bombs and they just tied dynamite to, to themselves and take off running into these tanks, trying to dismantle these tanks from going any further. I mean, that's the kind of fighting they brought to the equation. Uh, and then a lot of people look at history and they say, well, the you know, South Koreans were just so weak and, and you know, they ran away from it. And that's just not the case. That's just not the case at all. Not from, not from what I've gathered, not from what I've heard. I've talked to a lot of uh, veterans. I've talked to a few POWs from the war. And uh, they had high respect for their South Korean counterparts. Right? There's, there's one particular story I've been working on so along with the 21st infantry, you're looking at the 34th, the 1st Cav, uh, the 1st Battalion, 19th gets involved. The 1st uh, and 3rd Battalions of the 29th get involved, right? All, the, all these factors are in play in the very few first weeks of the war. And their job, basically, is to slow the process down so Walker can stabilize the Prusak perimeter. They were hoping to be uh, further and further north, but... Unfortunately, there was so much coming at them, you know, they had to find a way to just kind of hold the line, if you will. But there was one individual I was reading up on, uh, his granddaughter got a hold of me and wanted some information about the, uh, the 29th Infantry Regiment. Uh, her understanding of her grandfather's stories passed down from generation to generation was that he was a POW twice. And... I can't think of anybody off the top of my head that was in Korea that was a POW twice. So I looked him up. Uh, his name is William White. He's from Texas. He was captured early on about the uh, 29th and 27th of July. Right? 69 days later, the 34th Infantry takes a town where he was being held and he's returned to uh, military control, RMC, uh, about two and a half months later. And she contacted me because she wanted to hopefully find somebody else that was POW with him. Uh, I'm still working on that. We, we've not had much luck. And there's just not that many veterans left, bottom line. But I thought how unique to have a POW didn't have to do two years and three years like most of the POWs that uh, came out of the Korean War. Yeah. Um, so what kind of questions do you have? I mean, uh, you know, you're, you're a military buff. So we went into this opening um, 
in the invasion. So how many, you said he came in, I think, with 33, 234 tanks or 38. Um, how, how many men were total in this invasion? How many infantry did he have? Uh, you mentioned the air support. I mean, what kind of uh, 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 superiority did he have over the allies that were there? Uh, did the allies have any type of air support? I mean, uh, jets that could match them or slow them down? Um, well, the, this initial... the 84, the 84 Sabre was what they were bringing to the table. But you got to remember that the Navy wasn't in position. Task Force 77 and, and all their units weren't in position to give a lot of support at that point. Uh, I mean, this this was fighting on the spree. So the, mm -hmm. battle, the first battle starts on June 25th, right? And Task Force Smith doesn't hit the ground, I think it's uh, July the 4th. Because they they were going through the UN, they had to get a vote on the by the UN to confirm that you know we're going to go in, we're going to support this. You know, Truman didn't want this to be a solid, strictly U.S. forces in there, even though on the front end it was. In the end, there were fifteen out of twenty two countries that get involved in the war. Uh, fifteen countries out of the twenty two that get involved sent infantry. Let's put it that way. And the rest of them either sent financial support or medical support. Like I think the Swedes, Denmark, uh, they they sent uh, you know, hospital care, doctors, nurses, that kind of thing. How far did the, the uh, Kim Jong's forces push to? Well, all the way down to Tagu, uh, the Noctong uh, River, the Coon River. You know, all of these were, were attacked. Now, yeah, for people who don't know, where exactly is that located at? Um, like pro yeah, proximity, no, like, like no, bottom half, bottom third. Oh, um, probably less than the bottom third, actually. Probably uh, bottom eighth or, or fifth, somewhere in that equation. I'll yeah. try to put a map up, uh, find a map of it later and put in this. Yeah, if you find Busan, head north to Tegu, T A E G U, and just north of that, you're, you're going to find, uh, You'll, you'll see the Nocturne River you know, swinging over from the west and whatnot. And, and uh, those river fronts are basically the uh, the MLR. So was the South Korean forces or allies or what have you want to call it, were they putting up a, were they essentially doing a Fabian type strategy with a rear guard action, just trying to trade territory for time until they got uh, boots, more boots on the ground, or were they? It was absolutely that. It was absolutely territory for time. Uh, if you look at what happened to the 29th, the 1st and 3rd Battalions of the 29th Infantry, uh, you'll see that territory for time. You'll see uh, the 1st uh, Cab, I think, as much effort as they put into it, I think they, they only slowed the, the progress for about uh, 15 to 20 some odd hours. You know, But that's a full day of getting more people into the equation. You know, the, the Fifth RTT shows up. The Marines start coming in. Uh, by the time you get into August, you know the tanks are now rolling out. Army tanks, Marine tanks are starting to roll out, and now we got something to go against the T thirty four. The uh, bazookas were upgraded. We had the two point five six bazooka that go to the three point five. The well, three point five got the job done. So now you got to fight. Now we got to fight. So that that first two to three weeks. It's, it's all about saving time, right? Walker gets his Busan perimeter set up, his Busan, Busan, same thing. You get that perimeter set up. In, inside the perimeter, as these forces come in and he moves them towards the front lines, he's got guys covering gaps. He's got units covering gaps that might be two, three, five miles long, right? So he's moving from his reserves He's moving them up to the line and back and around with all this other traffic going on in the Busan perimeter where, you know, new units are coming in and whatnot. Trains are being loaded up. Ships are coming into the ports. It's, it's just hectic. And that doesn't include all the immigration. Everybody that was in South Korea, you know, around Seoul, they're, they're moved in with all these troops moving south. And, uh, you know, our troops... Now was the Korean government was there just following along with the forces for retreat or did, did uh, any of them get captured or 
By the middle of June, uh, Sigmund Reed gives over all control of his forces to uh, General Walker J. Thurman. And, yeah. and I think that's I think that was probably a very wise choice in that uh, you know, like when I look at Germany and World War II, you know, we had all these commanders with all these forces that you know they had control over infantry and air force and tanks. And there was, you know, a lot of chiefs when they and not enough Indians, if you will, or and how do you explain it? It it never fell down to one man of control. Like in Eisenhower, World War II, he had the whole kit and caboodle. You know, he had oh yeah, you talking about you're talking about like but with the, the Germans command, like how uh von Rundstedt had command of the tanks, uh right. uh um Goering had command of the Air Force. Okay. Castle Ring, everybody had a piece of this or that, and they were trying to control all these different things. Uh, it never fell on the one guy. Like when you see Eisenhower in World War II, it's Eisenhower. Yeah. It's like not to get told off, but like on um, the Western Front, um, Rommel was in charge of the defenses, but he had no control over the tanks. <laughs> yeah. it's The whole thing's wild. You know, it's. It, with a catch of catch can kind of thing. So I think Sigmund Reed did a good thing with regards to giving over control to General Walker. Now, who was command of the uh, uh, North Korean forces? Is Or is it actually a Russian commander that's pulling the strings from behind? Uh, I seem to recall his name was Kim. I think they called him Tiger Kim. Okay. This guy was, he, I mean, he was, he was tough as nails. And originally, he was North Korean, if, if memory serves. Uh, but he just didn't buy into that whole communist mindset that uh, Kim Jong Un was bringing to the equation. Kim Jong Il, I'm sorry, but um, yeah, the, the the leadership in Korea, in my opinion, it, if it had not fallen on Walker, and Walker not been the man that he was, uh, that that first part of the war might have been the end of the war. And you'll notice if you if you look at the war as a whole, getting about a year into it, it becomes pretty static. You know, Walker, along with General Patton, we, we lose two generals to car wrecks, which I thought was kind of a unique story. But when Walker gets killed, in comes General Ridgway. MacArthur gets in trouble with Truman, so he loses his job. You know, old soldiers never die speech. I don't know if you ever heard that. They never died. They just, they just fade away. They just fade away, right. That was the result of Truman firing uh, MacArthur. Now, do, you want, do you want to go into that now, or do you want to wait and save that for another episode? We can save that for another episode. But I, I just think it's interesting, the two different types of war that these two men fought. Ridgway was more reticent about sending artillery and fighting with air and artillery as opposed to manpower. But MacArthur's war in Korea was all about manpower and pushing. You know, let's push them out, let's get it done, and, you know, we'll be home early. And when they took and reinforced them across the 38th parallel, well then, hey, now we're going to be home by Christmas. And that didn't happen either. That's other parts of the war. We'll get into that later. Okay, so does that wrap up our first segment for this one, or... Let me get a good start. Let me get people to look at um, uh, some of the battles that, that happened on the front end of it the first few weeks. If you start with Task Force Smith, I'm going to put in a couple of plugs here. It's a good book you should get. It's called Fighting on the Brink by uh, Brigadier General Ent, E-N-T. It's a great book. Uh, it covers a lot of the uh, first parts of the war. It gives you a good understanding. Uh, you might want to read up on uh, the ambush at Hadong, that's H-A-D-O-N-G, um, the Battle of Chochuan, uh, the Battle of Osan, which is the 21st Infantry that we're speaking about today, and Task Force Smith. And that, that'll give your average reader to, you know, a, a good head start into the war. Okay, sounds good. Cool? Cool. All right, and one other thing, I sent you a link, uh, I sent you a, a poster, yeah, I'll put that in. Make sure to put that in there as uh, as the um, uh, the the picture to use. Yeah, yeah, they can anybody can use those those uh, scan codes and get to where we're going. We're still 
Still working on that. I haven't reached the numbers that we're looking for, but we are on our way. So fingers are crossed. All right. So let's talk a minute off camera there, Bob. Yes. Always a pleasure. Uh, I appreciate it, man. I love it. All right. Say again. I was uh hold up. 